Uh, several months ago, we, we had a presentation on climate change and some of the ideas to mitigate it, or as Greta Thornburg would say, all that blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, but today, uh, it's, yeah, climate change, but it's a little more personal. It's about how climate change uh, affects your personal health. So I think that's going to be a very, very interesting, a little different twist than what we've covered before. I would like to introduce our presenter today. So we have uh, Dr. Schiller, uh, who is Deputy Director of the Inova Shar Center, uh, Cancer Center. She is widely published and internationally recognized for her work in lung cancer clinical research. She is also the founder of a national advocacy organization aimed at raising awareness and funding for lung cancer. Dr. Schiller currently serves on the National uh, Cancer Institute Board of Scientific Counselor for, Counselors for Clinical Sciences and Epidemi Epidemiology. And, however, during her retirement, she has devoted her time to educating the public about the health consequences of climate change. And that's what brings her here today. So if you all please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Joan Schiller. Joan, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, David. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And I'd like to thank you, David, as well as Encore Learning for um, inviting me to come here and present. Um, as David said, I'm a medical oncologist. I'm the former deputy director of the Novashire Cancer Center here in Fairfax. And what I've been doing all my life is seeing and taking care of lung cancer patients and research um, in terms of developing better drugs for them. Like many of you, I suspect, I've been so busy that I rarely took my head out of the sand to see what was happening around me. Well, that's probably not a very fair analogy. Um, it would probably be more correct to say that I was so busy I had tunnel vision. I rarely thought about much else than work and family, let alone climate change. Even though one of my sons has worked in the climate change space for the past 10 years. Now, I'm sure many of you can relate to this. Uh, we get so caught up with our own career and family and day-to-day -day living, we simply don't have the bandwidth to take on an existential challenge like climate change. And that was me until, what, so what happened that made me kind of raise my head out of the sand or get to the end of the tunnel? Over the past 10 years, I, uh, we've been going to a cabin we have here in the mountains of Southwest Colorado. And our cabin is located right about there. <laughs> it's a beautiful area. The mountains are beautiful, the forests are beautiful, or at least they were until much of, the, many of the trees in the forest started dying because of this little guy here, the spruce beetle. The trees have been so stressed because of heat and drought, it has made them very susceptible to the spruce beetle. And seeing all this made me think about the effects of climate change on other aspects of my life, such as these guys, my grandson Bennett, who's currently seven, and my granddaughter Dylan, who's currently four. And it made me think, start thinking about what my generation is leaving their generation and their children's generation and so forth. And that made me think about also about the here and now and not only their health, but the health of my patients, my family and the community I live in. Now, as David said, I know you've had an excellent talk from Professor Jim Kenter about what climate change is why it's, and why it's happening but I'm going to take a slightly different view. I'm going to look at how it affects our health. Having said that, just a couple slides to very briefly review. As you know, usually much of the solar energy from the sun gets reflected back into space. However, some of it gets reflected, reflected back into space as infrared radiation. And greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such as methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide, trap this infrared radiation and re-radiate it back to Earth, thus warming the planet. When there's too much of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, more gets radiated 
more of the radiation gets radiated back to Earth and the planet warms up. It's as if this blanket of greenhouse gases which surrounds the Earth gets thicker. And where did these gases come from? From the burning primarily of fossil fuels. And we are putting a lot of greenhouse gases up there. This chart goes back about 800,000 years and shows how little carbon levels uh, naturally fluctuate. And it also shows how dramatic the change has been over the last hundred years since the Industrial Revolution. It is both the quantity of carbon that's being put up there, almost 60 billion tons each year, and the alarmingly fast rate, a hundred times faster than it normally happens in nature, which is so concerning to scientists. Let's uh, zoom in and focus in on the last 150 years or so, from the start of the Industrial Revolution, when CO2 really began increasing and accelerated in the 20th century. And just as you expect, um, this is the temperature um, overlaid onto the carbon dioxide levels. And just as you would expect, as the carbon dioxide levels rise, the temperature rises. And since 1880, the Earth's temperature has risen about 1.2 degrees centigrade or 2 degrees Fahrenheit so far. Now, I know that 2 degrees doesn't sound like much, but it is enough to get the medical and health professionals. And remember, these are the people who know about this stuff, right? They're the experts. And they are extraordinarily concerned. Just this September, um, over 200 medical and health journals took the unprecedented step of publishing the same editorial at the same time, calling the health effects of climate change catastrophic. The World Health Organization recently stated, climate change is the single, single biggest health threat facing humanity. The International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, warned that to avert catastrophic health impacts and to prevent millions of climate change related deaths, the world must limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And over 450 health organizations representing over 45 million health workers from um, over a hundred different countries have written an open letter to heads of states around the world calling the health effects of climate change a crisis. So what is it about climate change that makes it so unhealthy? Why is everyone getting more and more worried about it from a health perspective? Well, this is a schematic view showing four of the major consequences of climate change. They include rising temperatures, more extreme weather, rising sea levels, and increasing carbon dioxide levels. And these in turn cause a number of things which are harmful to our health. These in turn lead to extreme heat, severe weather, air pollution, diseases, increased allergies, effects on food and water quality and supplies, effects on the environment. And all of these will have a major impact on access to medical care. So let's start with extreme heat. This is actually an old slide. And by old, I mean it doesn't, it was from, and by old, I mean that it doesn't have the year 2000 on it. At the time this slide was made last year, you can see that the 10 hottest years on record have all been since 2009, and 2019 was the second hottest. Well, the data has finally come out for 2020, and 2020 has now beaten 2019 as the second highest hottest year on record. This is the for this is specifically at Washington, D.C., where it's clearly getting hotter. Look at how much our average temperature has increased since the 1970s. 
By 2100, this is equivalent of living in a border town on the Texas-Mexico border. That's what it will feel like. And yes, I mean, extreme heat is lethal. And when I say lethal, that means bad for your health. 27% of heat-related deaths worldwide are due to climate change. By 2080, a 20-fold increase in heat-related deaths are projected in countries near the equator. In the U.S., extreme heat exposure is linked to 65,000 emergency room visits each year. Thousands of people uh, in the U.S. Die, die each year from the heat, and that's projected to go up eight-fold by the end of the century. And why does this happen? Well, why is heat so bad for the human body? Well, in extreme heat, evaporation is slowed and the body must work extra hard to maintain a normal temperature. This in turn leads to heat stress, which is characterized by cramping, profuse sweating, rapid heart rate, dizziness, and fatigue. At 104 degrees Fahrenheit, our bodies are no longer able to perspire enough to cool ourselves down. That will lead to heat stroke, which can be lethal. Unfortunately, some of this has already started to happen all over the world. Some, for example, in, I'm sorry, for example, in 2003, 70,000 people died across Europe due to a heat wave. In 2010, 60,000 died in Russia. And just this summer, hundreds of people died in our Pacific, in our, our Pacific Northwest heat wave. And you can see what the temperatures were like. This is, you know, um, Vancouver and Portland, all above 100 degrees. But there are other effects as well, besides the direct effect on heat. And they've all been proven to be related to the direct effect on heat. For example, there's increased mortality from heart and lung failure, again, because our body is so stressed and working so hard to cool us down. A decline in cognitive functioning, meaning slowed response time, diminished accuracy, less sophisticated patterns of decision making. Premature births low birth weight births and congenital abnormalities all go up in uh, times of extreme heat. And massive aggressive, more aggressive behaviors leading to more assaults and murders and suicides. And finally, burns. One can get second degree burns from the touching of hot surfaces like doorknobs and metal handrails or asphalt. This picture was taken in Portland in July and the temperature of the blacktop was 155 degrees. So who is most at risk? Well, let's start out with senior citizens. On this graph, you can see how the heat related mortality in people over 65 has risen over the past 20 years by over 54% from 2000 to 2018 and in 2018, it reached 296 deaths uh, in the U.S. In, the pe in people over 65. And why? Well, the autonomic nervous system of the elderly, which is a system that controls sweating, doesn't work as well anymore. And this puts extra stress on the heart and lungs, which in the elderly also don't work as well. Who else is at risk? Well, danger days. Let's talk about danger days. They are days when the heat index is above 105 degrees. Um, the heat index incorporates both temperature and humidity. You often hear meteorologists say something like, uh, the high temperature today will be 85 degrees, but it'll feel like 95 degrees. Well, that's because of that's what the heat index reflects. Danger days are days when the heat index is above 105 degrees, when it feels like 105 degrees outside. And you can see how the number of danger days in Washington is expected to increase 
from, two, from the year 2000, when there were only about 10 danger days per month, to 31 days in 2030, to 49 in 2050. And who is going to suffer, suffer more and more from these danger days besides the elderly? Well, people who live in cities, we also are vulnerable. So the steel and concrete jungles of our cities absorb heat. And since there's less soil, grass, and trees, there's less evaporation to cool the air. This means that cities will heat up more than the surrounding areas. In fact, the annual mean temperature of a city can be four to 11 degrees warmer than the surrounding rural areas. And even within the cities, the temperatures can swing widely. Areas without, a, without trees or a tree canopy or green spaces, like many poor urban areas, can be even hotter by as much as eight degrees hotter than the neighborhoods with more green space. Athletes are also more vulnerable. During hot human weather, sweat can't evaporate as easily. And in fact, heat-related illnesses are the leading causes of disability or death among high school athletes. So as the earth gets hotter, we're going to see more and more high school athletes and games played inside. People who have to work outside, such as the police, firefighters, construction workers, those who pick up our garden for us every week, now, of course, they're already working outside now, right? And it's pretty hot now. But as the earth heats up, they're going to be working in hotter and hotter conditions and in more danger days. Pregnant women and their unborn babies. Extreme heat is associated with an increase in preterm birth rates, an increase in stillbirths and lower birth weights, even in full-term babies and we'll be seeing more and more extreme heat. Um, children are more vulnerable. Their autonomic nervous system, just the system that regulates sweating, is still developing. You know, we should develop something called playground days, days when it's safe to play in a playground, because we're going to be seeing fewer and fewer of those. More and more, kids will be spending more and more day, uh, time indoors to get out of the heat. And of all these groups, the most at risk are the 85% of humanity that does not have air conditioning. But air conditioning only works if our electrical grid works. Our current power infrastructure was not des designed to handle this heat. As you know, last year, California saw massive rolling blackouts due to increase um, air conditioning use. And this year, Spokane also had to have rolling backup blackouts. And of course, we all remember all the outages due to severe weather events, such as hurricanes and floods. So our infrastructure is not prepared to handle these events. Which brings us to severe weather. And let's concentrate on the two that are most, oops, and the two that are most likely to uh, affect the East Coast, floods and hurricanes. Hurricanes. Now I know we've always had hurricanes, right? But because of climate change, the oceans are warming and this is creating stronger hurricanes which intensify more quickly and last longer. We all know that hurricanes cause storm surges, high winds, tornadoes, and rain and flooding, with the storm surge being the most immediately dangerous and damaging part of the hurricane. But hurricanes do more than cause direct damage due to winds and flooding. For example, Hurricane Ida was a, uh, from this year was a Category 4 hurricane, which made landfall in Louisiana in August as one of the most powerful storms to hit the country, leading to deaths of at least 13 people in the area and leaving more than 400,000 without power for days. But what made Ida so unusual was its capacity for devastation long after it first reached land, 
Nearly three days after the storm hit Louisiana's coast, it lingered over up the coast toward the Northwest, dropping a record 3.24 inches of rain in one hour over Newark, New Jersey. And at least 43 people were killed in the area. And what are some of the impacts of hurricanes on health? Well, just like other disasters, hurricanes have major impacts on health. They, these impacts include the lack of basic clean food and water, widespread, widespread uh, pollution contamination, leading to an increased risk in infectious diseases such as typhoid and cholera, disruption of medical services, and inability to access healthcare and medicines in hospitals and clinics. And issues we don't always think about, such as the effects on delayed treatment for other chronic diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure, and effects on mental health, including stress, depression, and suicide. Hurricanes do even more than that to cause direct damage that will affect human health. During and after Hurricane Harvey, for example, tons of known human carcinogens such as benzene, vinyl chloride, butadine, and other industrial toxic substances were released into the surrounding neighborhoods and waterways. There were more than 100 toxic releases from 40 different sites. Nearly half a billion of and half a billion gallons of industrial wastewater mixed with storm water surged into one just out of one chemical plant in Baytown, which is east of Houston. And nearby, uh, a dioxin laden federal Superfund site had its protective cap damaged by the raging rivers, and that spilled into the surrounding waters. And I think it's probably very fair to say that all of this is damaging to one's health. What about heavy downpours? Well, they are increasing, particularly in the Northeast. This map shows the increase in heavy rain events in 1958, where a heavy rain event is defined as the heaviest 1% of all daily events. What are the health impacts from flooding? Well, they include physical injuries, of course, such as drowning, but they also include the risk of food and waterborne illnesses, such as Salmonella, Giardias. They include food insecurity, because where are people going to get their next meal? Displacement, where are they going to live, both in the acute setting during and after the storm, as well as long term? Are they going to have to migrate? Mental health issues including dealing with the stress of repairs, loss, displacement, even insurance issues. We all know dealing with insurance can be stressful. Interruption of emergency services. And one other thing, mold. Mold is enhanced by heat and moisture and can cause a variety of pulmonary problems such as coughing, wheezing, nasal and throat conditions. It can adversely affect uh, people with asthma or weakened immune systems. In the wake of hurricanes Katrina, Katrina and Reedy, sorry, Rita in 2005, for example, heavy mold growth was identified in um, 70,000 water damaged homes. Another example of how heavy mold can affect health Infants who are exposed to mold before the age of one are 2.8 to four times more likely to develop asthma. And needless to say, these events have economic consequences as well. This map shows all of the natural disasters in 2020 that cost Americans over a billion dollars each to fix. Between 1980 and 2020, the annual average number of billion dollar disasters was seven events per year. Between 2016 and 2020, it the average annual number of events was 16 per year. So far this year, as of October of 2021, 
there have been 18 weather or climate billion dollar debt a disaster events, which have resulted in the deaths of 538 people. And the year is not yet over. Okay, so let's turn now to the effects of air pollution. Um, so how does air pollution affect human health? Well, one of the major uh, pollutants associated with air pollution is something called particulate matter or PM. And PM 2.5 stands for particles less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And you can see just how small that is when compared um, to human hair. It comes from the burning of uh, fossil fuels in factories, power plants, motor vehicles. In, in fact, it comes from the burning of just about anything. And it has been rated a level one carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a specialized agency of the World Health Organization. One of the unexpected consequences from the COVID epidemic is that enabled us to see air pollution with our own eyes. Air pollution has emerged as the most significant killer of climate change, more than heat or severe weather events. It is responsible for one in five deaths worldwide, which is three times more than the deaths from the COVID pandemic. Breathing 2.5, needless to say, has serious health effects. Um, at first, Acute exposure exacerbates illnesses in people who are already having lung and heart problems, causing increasing shortness of breath and cough. Long-term effects include an increased risk for respiratory diseases such as asthma, COPD and pneumonia, heart disease, even lung cancer. So let's still uh, drill down on a couple of these, like asthma. It is estimated that um, if, we were, if we had followed the World Health Organization standards, we could prevent up to a third of all childhood asthma cases worldwide. And PM 2.5 can do other things as well. For example, air pollution is a carcinogen now PM 2.5 has been labeled as a carcinogen for many years. However, there are so many chemicals in air pollution that the International Agency for Research and Cancer, IARC, gave up and decided to call air pollution in general a carcinogen. Now, you know as, that a carcinogen is a cancer-causing agent, right? So what cancer does air pollution cause? Lung cancer. In fact, it is the second leading cause of lung cancer worldwide, even in people who have never smoked. People who have never smoked are at a risk of getting lung cancer because of PM 2.5. Air pollution is um, estimated to have contributed to about 13 to 14 percent of lung cancer deaths worldwide, which is about one of every seven deaths. Another thing um, air pollution can do is to make one more susceptible to other infections, such as COVID-19. Uh, it is thought that um, the risk of infection and death from COVID-19 from air pollution is between 15 to 19%, meaning that it increased the risk of an infection and death from COVID-19 and contributed to between 15 and 19% of all deaths. Now, of course, particulate matter, PM, just doesn't come from the burning of fossil fuels. It also comes from natural sources like smoke from fires. In California, five of the six largest forest fires occurred in 2021. Climate change has resulted in a longer fire season. The wildfire season out west is 105 days longer than it was in 1970. And with warmer temperatures, fires burn more quickly and cause more damage. 
This is a photo taken from the new, uh, taken of the New York City skyline. Um, it is, it, I know it is not evening. The poor visibility here was caused by wildfire smoke from the fires on the West Coast, thousands of miles away. This map shows the percent of all deaths attributable in the United States to PM 2.5. And you can see that the Northeast is uh, very much affected. In fact, the Northeast has a higher percent of mortality and morbidity from wildfire smoke coming from Northwestern states. And that is because so much other organic material is burned in wildfires. The long-term impact from smoke due to wildfires is much higher than that of air pollutants from the burning of fossil fuels. These photos were taken in July of this year. On the right, those black areas show the smoke from the wildfires from the west coast. And you can see once again that the northeast coast is smack dab in there. Well, what about here specifically in Virginia? PM 2.5 is expected to cause 3,000 pre premature deaths, 3,600 hospitalizations, and 1,600 emergency room visits every year. Now we've been talking about CO2, carbon dioxide as an air pollutant, but there is another air pollutant that we're starting to hear more and more about, and that's methane. Methane is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It comes from natural gas and agriculture. It interacts with nitrogen dioxide to form ozone and 370 million tons are released annually. It is estimated that for every ton of methane emitted, over 1400 people die uh, prematurely there are 4,000 asthma-related uh, emergencies, and over 300 million work hours are lost. Now, one thing that people don't know about natural gas is that it really should be called methane gas. 75 to, 80 per, to 85 percent of what we call natural gas is actually comprised of methane. And it has been uh, touted as a safe alternative to coal power fuels or fuels derived from the uh, combustion of fossil fuels, but it is not. Um, it causes diseases. And in fact, the EPA states that indoor air pollutant levels may be twice to as much as a hundred times higher indoors than outdoors. And methane has over 80 times the greenhouse gas impact of carbon dioxide. Globally, 4.3 million deaths were attributable to indoor household air pollution in 2012. About a third of these deaths were due to strokes, followed by ischemic heart disease and COPD. Household air pollution caused about 6% of the deaths due to lung cancer. Another consequence of climate change is the increase in what they call vector-borne diseases, which are diseases uh, caused by insects. And what does this mean? Well, it, as the climate change heats up, insects are expanding their range. And as they spread, they're bringing their diseases with them. Warmer weather also means that these disease-carrying vectors also reproduce more quickly. And they have a faster metabolism, which means, which means they want to eat more, which will cause spread of greater diseases. Now, the most common vectors in the United States are carried by fleas, mosquitoes, and ticks. In fact, illnesses from insect vectors have tripled in the United States from 2004 to 2016. Um, 
And those are just some of the many diseases spread by these vectors, but there are many more, as you can see from this video, and they are extending their range so that more people are being exposed for longer periods of time. Take malaria, for example. Malaria is carried by mosquitoes and until recently was rarely found in the United States. Now there are about 1,500 cases of malaria each year in the United States. And the red areas on this map show where malaria is projected to be in 2050. The rates of malaria in the US now are five times higher than they were in 1990. Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are one of the most prominent vectors for tropical diseases. And you can see that here in Washington, we are having more mosquitoes day, more mosquito days. In fact, some US cities have 200 days or more mosquito days per year. Recent research suggests that under a worst case scenario, the number of people exposed to mosquitoes could increase from 4 billion to 8 to 9 billion by late this century. And ticks, let's talk about ticks because Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States, the state spread by deer ticks. With an increase in temperature and longer breeding seasons, the range of the deer trick is, tick is spreading. It is estimated that a two degree centigrade increase in the average global temperature could increase the incidence of Lyme disease in the United States by 20%. Let's move on to an increase in allergens and their effect on public health. Another thing that is increasing as carbon dioxide levels go up are woody vines, like poison ivy, which is not only getting more common, but is getting bigger and more toxic, as you can see. And as the growing season lengthens, so does the allergy season. And as CO2 levels rise, pollen levels rise. They're expected to more than double by 2085 and the pollen season is longer. And we know that pollen is one of the biggest triggers of asthma. I'm sure all of you know that asthma is a condition in which a person's airway becomes inflamed, it becomes narrow, it swells, and it produces extra mucus, all of which makes it difficult to breathe. Out of the 24 million Americans who have some form of active asthma, about 50% of adults and about 90% of, ki of kids have a form of asthma called allergic asthma, in which their asthma attacks are, gener are triggered by a reaction to pollen or other airborne allergens. Allergens can interact with air pollution to amplify their individual effects. For example, if the ground level ozone level is high, then it takes much less uh, ragweed pollen to trigger an asthmatic attack. Okay, let's talk about waterborne diseases. As the earth temperature rises and, uh, and temperature, oh, water temperature will also rise and we are going to have heavier and downpours and floods as we've discussed. Now flood waters can contain disease causing bacteria parasites and viruses, as well as contaminants with agricultural waste, chemicals, human waste, and raw sewage. Flooded materials in homes and schools and businesses can cause mold to grow and be inhaled, contributing to asthma. There, these are the, I'm going to move on to waterborne diseases. These are the seven most common waterborne diseases. They have at least one thing in common, and that is they all cause diarrhea. And diarrhea is the second leading cause of death for children under the age of five. Okay, moving on to the impact of climate change on food. This is from the World Resource Institute, and it shows where food yield is projected to increase shown in green, or decrease, shown in red. If temperatures go up to three degrees Celsius or five point, which is the same as 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. 
you can see that almost all of the heavily populated areas of the world, food yields will decline dramatically. And that means that there will be a greater risk of global famine and it will increase dramatically by mid-century. Climate change also has impacts on crop quality and quantity. In the US, corn yields could fall by one third from heat stress alone by the end of the century. Another a recent US Day report projects soybean and corn yield could go down 80% in the next 60 years due to excessive heat. And it's not just the volume of crops that are going down, it's also the quality of the crops because the nutritional value also goes down because as CO2 levels increase, that reduces the levels of protein and essential minerals and essential minerals in crops. But the biggest source of methane, believe it or not, is agriculture, more specifically cows and sheep. That's because of something that is called ruminant enteric fermentation, which means that the cows and sheep and sheep eat obviously the plant uh, related food and it sticks around in their multiple uh, stomachs for, for a while. And as it does it, it ferments out methane. And that methane has got to go someplace and mostly it comes out of the cow in the form of burps. A little will come out of the cow in form of farts, but it is mostly burp, burps. It is responsible for all 40% of agricultural production emissions. Now I'm gonna add another factor to this pie chart that will have serious health consequences as we see more and more pandemics and severe weather events occur. And that is the fragility of our health system. And for that, I would like to use COVID-19 as an example. What has COVID-19 uh, shown us? Well, the stress of the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the stress on our capacity to handle sudden increase in numbers of sick people and dying people. I'm sure you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, they, there was um, problems with not enough hospital beds, ventilators, PPU, ICU beds, et cetera. It also showed us that the stress on it showed us the stress on staff, which we need obviously medical and hospital staff to keep us well. That includes not just doctors and nurses, but pharmacists, respiratory therapists, lab technicians, morticians, and people who help uh, cl clean and feed our hospitals, among many others. The pandemic has also showed us how tenuous our medical supply change is. Now you've all heard the past couple of weeks about the long wait that cargo, cargo ships have before they can come to port and deliver their goods. Well, in 2018, the same th thing happened in terms of medical supply chains. Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico and had a national effect on our healthcare system because the hurricane closed a factory that was responsible for the bulk of IV bags in the United States. And the result were, was national shortages of IV fluid and difficulties administering IV medications in many facilities. But perhaps one of the biggest uh, things we have learned is how deeply these severe weather events can reduce access to medical care. As we can see, as we see more and more weather events, we'll see more and more of our infrastructure uh, affected, power lines, phones, roads, bridges, that all of which will impact our ability to access medical care. For example, after Hurricane Harvey, 500,000 cars and trucks were rendered inoperable from flooding. And as much as 30% of the total US oil refining capacity was taken offline or reduced dramatically because of Harvey. 
In the medical setting, we see transportation is issues for both patients and staff, lack of adequate supplies, as we've talked about, loss of medical records and so forth. And something that we don't always think about, that the toxic waste events that can cause chemical uh, damage to chemical plants, as we described. I'm a medical oncologist, a cancer doctor, so I would be remiss if I did not talk about other ways climate change in the form of pandemics is going to have on cancer patients because we will be seeing more and more pandemics as those vector um, carrying insects spread. This is just one example of how climate change is going to affect cancer patients. It shows, the slide shows that the number of new breast cancer patients during the pandemic from March to the middle of March to middle of April. And you can see that the number of women developing breast cancer is going down, right? Which would be a good thing. But no, the reason it's going down is that fewer people were getting screened. The former head of the NCI, Ned Sharpless, predicts that we could have as many as 10,000 excess deaths from breast and colon cancer over the next decade due to the lack of screening, supply chain problems, inability to get to medical facilities, et cetera. And as we noted before, communities of color and low impact communities are often disproportionately affected by climate disasters and climate change in general. To illustrate that point, I think this is a very telling map. Babies born within five miles of downtown Richmond face up to a 20 year difference in life expectancy. This is due to a number of factors. Communities of color are more likely to be located by highways and factories. They're more likely to have limited access to primary care and their access to clean, healthy, fresh food and water is likely to be more limited. Using public transportation, it's harder to get around and they are more likely to live in unsafe or unhealthy lodging, which may be overcrowded and be exposed to more allergens. I think for the sake of time, I'm just gonna skip that slide and move on to another example, the Chicago heat wave in 1995. It, during that time, the temperature hit as high as 106 degrees but with the heat index, it felt like 126 degrees. There were over 700 heat-related deaths over a period of five days. And the people who were most affected were black, elderly, or poor, residents of the city who either could not afford air conditioning or did not want to open windows or sleep outside for fear of crime. And the CDC says that catastrophic effects due to excessive heat, lack of food and water, rising sea levels, which we didn't have a time chance to talk about today, will lead to mass migration and international conflict. For example, the Syrian refugee crisis was caused by 5 million refugees leaving the country due to a war which was catalyzed by a severe drought. And I think we can all agree that needless to say, chaos and conflict will not be good for healthcare, especially when the system is already fragile. In fact, even the Department of Defense has identified climate change and the lack of global coordination as a urgent and growing threat. This is a report to Congress from the Department of Defense. It says, climate change is an urgent and growing threat to our national security, contributing to increased natural disasters, refugee flows, and conflicts over basic resources such as food and water. These impacts are already occurring, and the scope, scale, and intensity of these impacts are projected to increase, increase over time. That was written in 2015. 
60 years ago. So let me just summarize. Climate change impacts a wide range of health outcomes. Um, I know we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the four most important things that climate change causes, rising temperatures, more extreme weather, rising sea levels, and increasing carbon dioxide levels. We talked about how these four things will affect our environment. And we've talked about the subsequent health outcomes from these. I'm going to just pause a second here and talk about what's going well. I know we've talked about a lot and I know it can be overwhelming and I know it feels like there's no hope, but there is some good news. People have been, some people have been um, knowing that climate change is coming for decades and have started to prepare for it. So I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about some of the advances that have been made. And one of the biggest advances by far is that the costs of renewable energy have plummeted. This graph shows the cost of electricity since 2009, and you can see how much the cost of solar energy has gone down. Right now, today, solar and wind are the cheapest form of power generation, even cheaper than coal. And we have new uh, technologies that will be transform transformational, transformable. Electric cars will be cheaper to produce than gas-powered cars by 2027. And as you know, more and more car makers are making them, with some manufacturers planning on selling only electric cars by the middle of the decade. Regenerative farming involves techniques such as planting cover crops, reducing filling, applying compost, and has already been shown that it can revitalize the soil. We're starting to see more and more electric taxis, buses, rail, and in fact, they're even working on electric airplanes. And we are using less and less energy in our buildings as we build and decide, design them better, using electricity or solar for fuel and using smart technology. Some emerging technologies include clean hydrogen, um, carbon capture, which means reusing some of the carbon we put into the air. There are technologies which are sucking carbon out of the air and storing it in the ground, and even nuclear power on a much smaller and safer scale. But in the meantime, what can we do now to help preserve our health and those of our loved ones? Well, these are just some common sense things such as monitoring air quality and staying indoors when air quality goes down or pollen counts are high or temperatures go up, stay hydrated, do outdoor activities in the mornings or the evenings. Some things about allergies and vector-borne diseases. Watch out for mold in your house. Check your area for mosquito breeding areas on your property. Examine yourself for ticks after being outdoors. Use insect repellent and protect yourself against water contamination. Now, we've all seen lists like this regarding what you can personally do to reduce your carbon footprint. I won't belabor it because um, I know you've all seen lists like this before. What else can you do? Advocacy. Advocate for policies to accelerate the transition to a stable climate environment and a healthy future. We need to rebrand climate change, not just as an environmental problem or a social problem or a political problem, but as a public health problem. Support some of the many nonprofits working in this space. Some are focused on clean energy, some on protecting the environment, others are focused on talking to policymakers. Talk to your leaders and poly policymakers and vote. Now, I know this seems like an impossible task, but I would like to leave you with a quote from Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist, which says, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed, committed citizens can change the world. 
Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. So with, with that, we're going to move into uh, Q&A and um, Louise Kenny, uh, Encore Learning's own Vanna White will uh, handle those duties. So, okay, take it Thank away. you, David. Joan, your presentation, while depressing <laughs> and upsetting, was important and uh, very well done. So thank you very much. It, mm -hmm. keep, have to keep hearing it. And, and you're, you really brought up dimensions of it that we don't think about top level. So, exactly, so, yes. mm -hmm. so thank you for that. So um, a question came up early on from Linda. And Linda, if, you're, if you can unmute yourself, you might want to clarify this. I made a note uh, to ask you about the mechanism between uh, aggression and heat. Now, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, Linda, by mechanism. Uh, I guess it's the, really the relationship of aggression and heat, how, how, how heat contributes to aggression. I, um, I think that's a great question that I do not know for sure the answer to, but it has been well documented that um, uh, uh, crime, aggression, murders all go up in the summer and also up in extreme heat waves as well. And whether it's just that people are so much more uncomfortable, the tempers run short, I don't know, but it is a well-documented phenomenon. Thank you. Uh, uh, Meredith um, Haynes asked the question, this is terrific information. It seems like the health benefits of, st of stopping the burning of fossil fuels and plastic trash is reason enough for it, for it uh, and on its own to move to clean energy. Does Dr. Schiller know of any calculations of the health cost savings in moving the U.S. to clean energy versus the health costs associated with business as usual? Boy, I do not know, but that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, and I will have to find that out because it, it is very important. So I'm sorry, I don't know, Meredith. Probably in the billions would be my guess. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're talking up there. Uh, Steve Shapiro asks, can you explain how climate change increases the incidence of both drought and flooding? The causes of flooding seem intuitive, but the linkage to drought is less obvious if warmer, where, if warmer air is more humid and results in heavier precipitation. Well, that's the reason why there's heavier precipitation on the East Coast, certainly, warmer air uh, can hold more water. Um, but in the desert, traditional desert areas of uh, the United States and the world, um, they don't have as much water in their um, environment. And so all that happens with warmer wear is it makes it evaporate faster and sooner, and hence making it even drier. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Terry, uh, wait a minute, one second. Um, Terry, uh, probably Smith, I think it, uh, it is, um, asks, how much is air pollution, how much is air pollution reduced during the pandemic by people working remotely? Some businesses are now letting employees work remotely many days during the week or indefinitely. Any mm -hmm. statistics on that? Well, I'm sure there are, but I just don't know it. But on the other hand, as I showed you one photo, and there are many other examples of, um, of cities pre-pandemic and during the pandemic. And during the pandemic is when people were working remotely and were at home. And so those are major differences that you certainly can see with your own eyes. Not only it's in not New been York, documented. It has not been documented, the difference in emissions or any, anything relative to that? It, it may very well have been, but I don't know those numbers. Sorry. Okay. So the uh, timely news is the new infrastructure bill. Do you have any idea what's in that relative to health and, uh, and uh, the uh, climate change and any, any of the things that you talked about? Um, some of it is going to be used for putting up charging stations across the United States for electric cars. Um, I think there's going to be money in there for electric school buses and um, 
um, ele yeah, electric school buses and electric, uh, you know, public buses. Um, what's not in there, which I think everybody wished was in there, but maybe in this next upcoming bill is putting what they call a price on carbon, a tax on carbon. So what that is, is um, taxing carbon polluters and then redistributing that money to the public is in the form of the dividend. And if Congress would pass that, that is probably one of the best ways to get uh, carbon polluters to decrease their carbon emissions. Thank you. Um, Richard Junkie uh, also make, made a note that people can take a note about if you're interested in becoming involved with this issue, there's a website in a group called citizensclimatelobby.org. Mm -hmm. right. Citizens, plural, climatelobby.org. So uh, Steve Shapiro, who asked the question about uh, commuting and the air quality, says, yes, the EPA has shown the impact of less commuting on air quality. Uh, so we can do that. Uh, David uh, Tate, whom you've met earlier, has the question, what is the best place to move to in light of all of these dire situations all around the country? I have no have any, idea. Do you have any idea? No. No, I, I, I've heard people say some cities and others say other cities, but I think they may be wishful thinking. <laughs> well, also, you know, often you hear about the Northwest being so healthy in Seattle, people are so health oriented, and yet they've had fires up there, right? They've had extreme heat up there recently, you know, last year or so. So, you know, the, all, all bets are off, right? Really. What I've heard more is the Northern mis Midwest, um, it's got to be northern because it's going to be too hot elsewhere and they don't have as many problems with any of those things that we've talked about so we're talking minnesota canada okay in that area but i think i think joan i'd read that ireland also is a uh, a place that you could think about moving to of course of course there is the uh, problem of understanding uh people the different mm -hmm. slightly different language but uh Maybe it was tongue in cheek. So with the moving to Ireland, yeah. Um, uh, Bill Mugg asked the question: What do you know about the projections for additional flooding in the Upper Midwest? <laughs> you just mentioned Upper Midwest and its impact on the Mississippi River. Anything that you've heard? Um, well, there certainly will be more flooding. That's for sure, and the rivers will rise, including the Mississippi River. Um, but how much and when, I, I do not know. Um, but you know, there have been massive floods through the Mississippi and the Missouri in the past, just due to heavy, heavy rains. Um, and we're gonna be seeing more and more of those. Um, I just read a book about a huge um, flood of the uh, Mississippi in the early 1900s. It was something like 1912. and how all the levees broke and how far the water expanded on both sides of the Mississippi. Um, clearly now levees are stronger um, as we saw with New Orleans, but uh, it remains to be seen how high the Mississippi will rise. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve Shapiro comments again that your map shows that Canada and Russia may be the agricultural superpowers as temperatures rise. And certainly that was the great band of green, right? Across yep. your, your yep. map. Um, so. So they might very well be. Um, it will depend upon, I guess, how much it rises and um, how long it takes. But yes, if, if that map is true, which we certainly expect it to be, yeah, Canada and Russia will be up there. Joan, are you... Uh, are you familiar with, it's of course, brand new news, the uh, the climate agreement supposedly that was reached. Yeah. Uh, are you, have you even skimmed any of the provisions in that? And, and do you have any faith that the provisions that are provided will substantively help climate change? Or oh. is it just too new? Um, it's just too new. And I, I have not personally had a chance to review that. I will say um, what I have heard though is and this is a if, and it's a very, very big if. If countries um, do what they have promised to, it's not. It will. Um, 
It will not get us to where we need to go by uh, 2030 or 2035, um, but it will get our, us closer. The big if is will countries do what they have promised to? Versus what Greta says, blah, 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 right? That's <laughs> yeah. her shorthand from. Um, Richard Junkie says the um, championing the uh, climate, uh, citizens' climate lobby is championing, championing the carbon fee and dividend approach that you mentioned earlier. So if people are interested in advocating for that, that's a good organization. So uh, ne next question from Quentin Schiller is, uh, do you think that lung cancer will stay as deadly with respect to other cancers? I think you mentioned that it was the second leading cancer yeah. of death worldwide. Uh, will it stay in that position? It was the second leading cause of de death due to um, air pollution. Um, so um, it, it, in terms of air pollution, it, res it is responsible for about 13 or 14% um, of lung cancer deaths. And of note, that can happen even in people who have never smoked. Um, I would think that, unfortunately, if, if air pollution gets worse, that is likely to go up. That number is likely to go up, not down. Okay. Is, are you related to Quentin? Quentin? As a matter of fact, yeah. He's my son. It's, it's a, it's <laughs> a little, little coincidental. So, mm -hmm. hi, Quentin. <laughs> uh, Meredith uh, Haynes asks, do you recommend people replace gas cooking appliances with electric? Um, well, I most certainly recommend um, if they're getting new appliances or moving into a new home, very much so using electric. Um, I think, um, I don't know how much it would cost to replace a good, a working gas stove with an electric stove. Um, at this point in time, um, and much of the problem you see with methane and gas stoves, yes, it is in the United States for sure, even more so overseas where their, their stoves are even dirtier per se. China has a very high incidence of lung cancer and never smoking women of all things. And they think it's because of the indoor smoke from their cooking. Uh, we don't have any more questions here. I, I so it's, uh, it's, Louise, Louise, yeah. I mean, I just, one, one of the things that uh, Joan, you might be able to clear up a question for me, uh, it, having to do with electric cars, which seems, you know, a lot of people are promoting that as a bit of a, you know, significant uh, panacea. And one of the things I have trouble understanding, I mean, to the extent that right now, a lot of electricity is generated by power plants that are using fossil fuels. It seems as though, I, I'm not sure how that uh, really, helps uh, cut down on CO2 emissions, just switching to, to electric cars. Maybe sometime in the future when we get power plants off of fossil fuels, but for right now, it doesn't seem like it makes much progress. Is, 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 that, is there something I'm missing? No, I think, I think you're right, but with electric cars, it's twofold. One of which is if it replaces gas combustion vehicles, that's a win right there, right? Because a lot of our CO2 comes from the burning of, uh, is from gasoline and the burning of that type of fossil fuel. So if we could get even rid of that, that would be very, you know, very helpful. Um, you're, you're absolutely right, though, that most power plants work off of combusting fuel, uh, fossil fuels. And so one of the major things that we need to do is to get away from those. And they're one of the big culprits is coal. And as I'm sure you all know, there right now there is a lot of uh, going back and forth on the political spectrum of whether or not we should be replacing our um, coal plants. And that's a difficult one. But you're right, Dave, you need both. You need both the coal plants, et cetera, to become um, go down and replaced with a, um, a, a cleaner form of providing um, fuels for uh, transportation 
and you need the electric cars, um, which will hopefully and will, um, reduce the amount of CO2, which is coming from that sector. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Appreciate it. Jonah, I'm happy to tell you that Alexandria, which is where I live next to Washington, closed its coal burning facility maybe five years ago. So oh, and it's going to be right? redeveloped into new housing and, and that kind of thing. So oh. we're, we're very proud of it. Actually, uh, Mike Bloomberg in, in uh, New York funded uh, the big effort to close that facility. Oh, really? oh. That's, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh -huh. So um, you didn't mention noise pollution. Is that related at all to climate change in your view? Or is that a kind of a secondary secondary thing? Yeah, I, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, it's related to uh, climate change, only in the sense that if you have more vehicles on the road causing more air pollution and climate change, it's gonna, the road's going to get noisier. But um, that's the only route I can think of. Okay, okay. And I have no more questions here, but I did have, I mean, we, somebody did ask, or Chris asked, actually, can you give us kind of your top three health tips for people that are of a certain age that uh, could help help themselves personally, but then also help in the greater fight for, for uh, against climate change and, and, and the health implications? Three top top things that would be most impactful. I would say switching to electric, uh, some form of electric cars or transportation, or, and I should say not or, and doing more physical ways of getting around, walking, bicycling, for example, would both re reduce the amount of carbon dioxide put into the air as, to well, as well as to make one healthy. Um, the other thing would be in terms of food. As I mentioned, one of the big contributors to methane, and methane is a serious problem. I mean, it's, very, it's more potent than carbon dioxide. And much of it, believe it or not, as we said, comes from cows. So another thing one could do to both protect their health as well as decrease methane emissions would be to eat less meat red meat from cows and sheep. Uh, I think a lot of people that, go to, that are part of it, who are learning um, espouse that philosophy to start with. So you're talking a little bit to the choir and that's a good thing. So thank you <laughs> for reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Shapiro asked if you'd be willing to give us a way to contact you if, you if we have other questions, but we can do that offline. You know. Sure, but I also, oh, um, you can put my um, email in the chat if you would like. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask David or Viv Vivian to do that. Um, and one last question is, uh, Marge Singer uh, asks, can any progress occur in reducing pollution if people do not change their consumption patterns? I, I'm, by consumption, meaning consumption of food or consumption of fuel? The way we live fewer cars, um, eating differently, you know, the way we live, our, our lifestyle. Um, it all no, comes I don't, that, right? I don't think that we can have a meaningful reduction in carbon dioxide levels, which is what contributes to climate change, without reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. There's not going to be any way around that. Okay, thank you. Marge, I saw your additional comment there, but I think uh, Joan is addressing that. Um, David just put in the chat your email address for everybody that would like it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, Joan H. Schiller at gmail.com, right? Correct, yes. Yeah, okay. So you're in uh, Colorado, right? The yes. beautiful, pristine Colorado that's not as pristine as it used to be, I guess. No, yeah. not at all. Well, I mean, well, last year, Colorado had three of its four biggest um, uh, fires in its history. And we were all very worried about our cabin in that area because of all those dead uh, uh, spruce trees. I mean, we're... I'm pretty darn sure at some point, someday, it's going to be a tinderbox, just like in California. You know, you have enough dry, dead wood laying around, and it doesn't won't take much to get it started. So, 
it was a, oh, breaks your heart. Really sad, yeah. So, well, Joan, clearly people are interested in what you have to say. Clearly you are um, very knowledgeable about this and very generous in sharing all this in a very uh, a factual way, but in also a very human way that people can relate to. Um, so mm -hmm. I was noticing the sources of a lot of your slides and it looked like there's a lot on the CDC website. Um, you know, I, the master slide that you had was, was great. I was thinking I need to go there and print it out and kind of look at it some more. So mm -hmm. uh, everybody at CDC has, has a lot of that, I think. And, uh, and uh, you had one other source that I noted. Um, another, another source is um, climate, uh, now I'm gonna keep talking, I'll, fight. I'll think of it here in a second. <laughs> Uh, uh, Noah, so that, um, no, it's climate. Uh, so, uh, climate Central, sorry. Climate Central. Cli Climatecentral.org. And they're an organization that um, specializes in making many of these graphs. So they've oh, got all sorts of interesting graphs and tables and data on their website. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd also remind everybody that our towns have aggressive climate uh, task forces and plans. I know Alexandria does here in Arlington, so active, I'm sure you do as well. So that's another way to get involved on a bigger level yes. than your own, than your own household and your own, you know, yourself personally. So, well, Joan, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was just great, and uh, uh, we're we're grateful. We're well, thank grateful. Thank you.